crazy thing is now, you know, if I flash forward three years or whatever, um, we basically, everyone gets paid more money. Everything goes smoother. Um, and everything just lined up. We basically quit talking about selling roofs and trying to grow the company and focused on, you know, making sure we'd all have jobs in a year or two. Cause it was, you know, when it, that, that may, it was, like I said, it was, if someone would have walked in and said, Hey, I'll buy you up for a dollar, taking all your debt and everything. I'd, all you would have heard is my tennis shoes squeaking to the door, you know? <laughs> so, um, but we just changed our whole focus, looked at everything. I mean, the way we buy material, the way everything, yeah, everything was on the table. This is the Wealthy Contractor Podcast, brought to you by G4 Marketing. Interviews with today's top home improvement entrepreneurs about marketing, sales, money, mindset, and lifestyle. Now, here's your host, Brian Kaskavalsian. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. This is Brian Kaskavalsian with G4 Marketing Group. And today, I have got another great roofer on with us, Kirk Koskanimi. I got it right. That's right. right? Yep. <clears throat> so I, we were just talking before we turned on the recording. It's like, you know, people of, of all people in the whole world, like that should quickly get how to say people's names. Um, I guess it should be me. Um, but I always, uh, I just always want to make sure, cause I know what it's like to get your name, uh, to get your name butchered. And uh, so Kirk Koskanimi from Ibex Roofs, he's out of Vancouver, Washington. So welcome, Kirk. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So um, quick plug for the Seven Secrets book. Um, I have free copies. I buy copies. You pay uh, a small delivery fee. Um, the Seven Secrets to Becoming a Wealthy Contractor. If you don't have a copy of the book, uh, go and get a copy. You can go to thewealthycontractor.com. You'll see a button there that says get the book and you will be able to get the book for free. Um, again, I pay the book, you pay a small uh, delivery fee. All right, Kirk, so uh, a little bit of backstory. So I met Kirk a few years back at a certainty event that I did either in Portland or or Seattle. Seattle. And um, you were a client for a while, but you and I we never really talked. I guess um, I didn't I didn't know a whole lot about your business except that you ran a really great business um, out there in. Um, in uh, Portland and in uh, in Washington, and um, recently uh, you joined our highest level wealthy contractor mastermind group, and so I have since learned a lot more about you, um, about your business, and I thought you would be an amazing guest because you've done quite a bit over the last few years. So before we jump into, and I want to specifically ask Kirk about a couple of things. One is implementation, how he gets so much done and so quickly. And then also I want to touch on profitability um, with Kirk. But first, Kirk, can you give us the backstory? Give us kind of the two minute version of your backstory. Uh, Two minute back version is... uh... I'm 34 years old. So uh, when I was 16, I started working for a fence and deck contractor. Um, Worked there for 12 years, started out in the, uh, just working in the shop, um, digging ditches, sweeping floors. Uh, Went to uh, night school, excuse me, uh, for management and operations. And then I ended up working there 12 years. Um, It was the best job ever. And, uh, but I started to get bored and, uh, decided I was going to buy out a company because we'd kind of start grow that, growing that company from essentially nothing to around 3 million or so, uh, six years ago. And, uh, so I gave my old boss who I'm still good friends with, um, gave him a 
uh, four month notice, I was gonna buy a roofing company, everything was just perfect. And then two weeks before I was gonna buy the roofing company, <clears throat> the, uh, the guy backed out. So I ended up starting Ibex Roof from scratch, uh, having never done a roof before at the time. And uh, so it's been, it'll be six years in May, which I think is next month or so. And uh, we currently have, uh, I ended up buying a commercial company a year and a half ago or so. Um, so we currently have about 60 employees between the two companies. And um, we do operate on the EOS uh, principles. And I learned about that at my last job, the last two years I worked there. Um, we implemented that there and they're doing it and that company's doing awesome. And uh, I've kind of built mine around the same set of uh, operating Give us a, principles. Yeah, so you've got 60 uh, total employees. How many salespeople? Um, so, our residential side, we have two two salespeople for re roofs, uh, one salesperson for gutters, and one salesperson for repairs. Basically, uh, commercial side, we just have one estimator. That's a totally different thing. So yeah, and about how many jobs did you complete in twenty twenty? Around three hundred re roofs, and probably I don't know about the same amount of repairs. Get yeah. Paid. So your each of your salespeople are pretty productive. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> pretty productive. Yeah. So you started the business from scratch. So you're going to buy a company, um, and you had never done a roof before. Uh, which, by the way, is the best way to get into any business. Is yeah, never having. Me a lot. Yeah, is <laughs> never having done the thing before because you have to focus on. Um, you're not focused so much on doing the work as much as you are building the business so you can eat. Um, so what was that like? Like, where, where'd you even start? Um, I took about two weeks and, uh, cause that's about how much time I had two weeks and built a, a website from scratch. I mean, did everything from scratch. Um, like I said, I had a good job, so I maxed out all my lines of credit and everything. So I had some breathing room. Uh, basically, the first month I was building my website, bidding my jobs, getting the marketing stuff set up. Um, and I hired, uh, for my first job, I uh, hired a guy that I went to school with who was an engineer. And I mean, the first year it was basically me not paying myself, losing money and working. I don't know, 80 hour weeks. A lot. Probably. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, learning how to roof off of YouTube. And uh, yeah, I literally bought the uh, certainty manual and learned how to roof off that. And uh, so the first year and a half, two and a half years was just super rough, basically. But yeah. So you were, you were a marketing, you were selling, um, you were also helping get the work done. Oh, all of it. Yep. All of it. Everything. I mean, I do my bids, I'd, you know, work all day and then seven o'clock in the summer, it's still light out. They do a few estimates. Um, yeah. And so that was your first couple of years in the business. Yeah. The first, the first half a year, I think we did like from May to December, like 400,000 or so. And then the next year was like 900,000. And then I think the third year was probably like 1.3 or 1.5 million or something like that. So, wow. So um, what started to happen? What started to happen in order for the growth to, and were you profitable at that 1.3 million? No, I honestly wasn't profitable until uh, probably three years ago. Um, okay. One thing I, so I did almost everything wrong, except for I, I knew roughly where, where I wanted to be as far as, um, you know, say $4 million was kind of the spot where I had to have, uh, the one thing I did do right was I hired good people before I could afford them, pay them good money and didn't pay myself, <clears throat> which uh, I was able to 
which is risky. I don't know if I do it that way again, but um, I had good people. So I was able to, to scale up, and build a for them people, basically. How did you know they were good people? It's a good question. Um, I'd say I got lucky. I mean, the one, the main guy that's still with me today, I went to uh, basically high school with him, college with him. Uh, he went for engineering, Travis. He uh, did engineering for <clears throat> a week and then decided, told his boss that it's not for me. Uh, he had construction background too. So uh, I just, I knew him and I knew he's a good guy. And I knew that uh, he's an engineer, analytical type. Um, yeah. So just a good, a good yin and yang. Um, kind of our saying is uh, I whack him, he stacks him. So <laughs> nice. I just make a pile and he makes some order out of it. So. Right. We, you, yeah, we, uh, especially us types, we need those people around them, around us. Yeah. Um, and then I hired kind of the, then once I finally started, um, I hired a few good roofers and that was a game changer because, I mean, we were doing it and we were figuring it out and we we're doing a good job, but not fast and not profitable. I mean, we were kind of my main thing. I'd seen it from the previous company was, um, we're focused on the customers from day one. So, <clears throat> I mean, right away we were building up that referral work and taking care of them, you know? Yeah. Cause ripping's not hard, but it's, uh, it's hard work and, you know, taking care of every customer is the hard and important part, you know? So. So that takes you, um, two and a half, three years, you hired good people, um, paid them more um, yep. than you could afford, um, which is a really good strategy as long as you're hiring good people. Yep. Um, and then, so then kind of what happened next? What started to happen next? Um, so what happened is we had to transition to where, you know, I was out of the field and Travis was out of the field and we had to basically turn into a real company where it was, um, I think we started after we hit a million dollars in sales was kind of my, okay, this is when I'm going to start implementing the EOS and the organization. So we hit that, um, started implementing that. Uh, and honestly, as a new, a new company, we just went through a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a, there was a time when we were, that was 2018. We were being 2018, we we're like 200,000 in the hole. And we just had too many people, too overhead heavy, not getting stuff done. We had to make some hard decisions. And uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of bumps along the road, but I don't know if that answered your question. Or well, not. but EOS helped you to recognize th the people that were not the right people, let's say. We yeah. Call, you know, they call it right people, right seat. Um, and there was, <clears throat> I mean, there, we got rid of people that were good people. And, you know, it's kind of funny, the people that we got rid of at the time may have been good people if we were to hire them back now, as we're more mature with better systems and that kind of stuff, you know. Let's pause here for a quick break. In today's world, getting a five-star review on Google from every single one of your customers is critical. This is something that G4 Marketing Group helps hundreds of home improvement and home services companies with every day. So we put together a free five-star customer experience checklist to help you ensure every one of your customers are getting an experience that will turn them into raving fans. You can get your copy of the customer experience checklist today. Just go to g4marketing.com forward slash C-E-X. The checklist will walk you through 30 points in your customer journey that you can improve today. That way, you'll be able to turn today's customers into tomorrow's leads, sales, and profits. Just go to g4marketing.com forward slash C-E-X. That's G-F-O-U-R marketing.com forward slash C-E-X to get your copy of the checklist today. Then, when you're ready to automate your relationship marketing so that your customers grow your business for you, just give G4 Marketing a call at 305-856-8788 and we'll give you a free demo. 
to show you how your future business profits are hiding in today's customers. Now let's get back to the episode. So when you when you started EOS, it was you and Travis and who else? Now, let's just be clear. The people, you know, you've heard us talk about EOS here a hundred times, but if you're new, um, Kirk, do you want to tell people just kind of like a, what is EOS? Um, so what I would say it is, is basically all the good business books combined into one program that you can start actually implementing it tomorrow or today, even better. Right. Um, it's uh, all steak, no sizzle. So it's, it's nothing new, nothing sexy, but it's, it just works. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's called the entrepreneurial operating system. It's based on a book called traction. Um, and um, it is an operating system for the business and it's, it's, it's really amazing. So um, it was you, it was Travis, I'm assuming was he the integrator yep. and you were the visionary. Yeah. Okay. Very much so. Integrator is basically the, um, person like what he said about Travis he's you know the visionary is the one that makes the messes and it really has you know this is where we're going with the business and then it's the integrator's job to take that mess and you know turn it into systems and processes and people to get the to get the stuff done did you have somebody that was accountable to sales at that point uh that would have been me at that point okay yep. and so uh so you were the visionary, you were accountable for sales. Were you also accountable for marketing? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So when we first started, it was basically um, me and Travis, and then he did all the operation stuff. I did the sales and marketing. Okay. So, so what you then brought in from EOS was what? The scorecard, accountability? Yep. All that stuff. So uh, accountability chart, core values is a huge part of figuring out you know, what you want more of and less of as far as people. Yeah. Um, scorecard was probably the best part for just keeping tabs on your business. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the vision building things and other things, especially with what I was doing, we wanted to get to, I was basically taking a risk by saying, okay, I'm going to get to this level in sales so I can have these type of people build afford these type of people working for me long-term. Um, and so we were able to bring that, you know, four or five year vision down to basically actionable, actionable items every year, every 90 days, every week. So we're constantly heading toward that goal. Yeah. Um, at that time, so we're talking what we're in, that we're in about 2018 at this point. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then that year, that was the year that you guys did the 1.3 million? We might have been um, two point something by then. Yeah, because I think that's a that's when I must have met you. 2016, we started the EOS process basically right after we hit a million. Oh, so okay. It was 16. Late, late, so early to late 16, early 17. Okay. So okay. And then um, so profitability then came um when how did it take a couple us, of years did it take three years 2018 was our first profitable year now um, did you so, do that i hate to ask it this way but did you do that kind of intentionally or that's just kind of how it it came up because you wanted were you putting the money back into the business or you were just you were just not getting the numbers right to get the money out of it both um <clears throat> One thing we found out is <clears throat> every time we grew, which is super common, you grow, you buy a dump truck, the transmission goes out of the dump truck, there's 10 grand. So as we were growing, we kept on, you know, we'd lose a little bit of money, raise our prices, still lose a little bit of money. And when you're looking at a P&L, you, you're looking at history. So you're always playing catch up, when you're, especially when you're growing at a fast rate. Yeah. So it's really hard to raise your prices to where they need to be, essentially. Um, and then 2018, we just got, that was the point where we got Travis locked down in the office, made him read his 
to do's from the EOS meetings were to read financial books and say, hey, figure out how to make money. Um, because I mean, making money is honestly not what drives me. But if you don't make money, it's you're right. Screwed. You can't do the rest of this stuff. Yeah, you can't so, get bored. Um, you can't get bored and go buy another company. Exactly. So. And you can't um, feed. How many mouths do you have to feed? Get the, the eight, wait for this. Eight kids. Eight so. kids. And how did how did it turn out to be eight kids? Uh, we had five kids, and then. A, a little over a year ago, we got surprised with triplet girls. So triplet girls a year ago. It was actually a week after I had signed on the commercial company. So um, <laughs> I just I like to read I like to read a lot of quotes and stuff. And uh, I just read a quote that said, uh, "Man plans, God laughs." Yep. And uh, I I read that like a week before, and I got the call from my wife. And it was the first thing that hit me in the head. You know, she called me from the doctor's office, and I was like, "Well, makes sense," you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yeah. So he's doing all of this, and he's got eight eight kids at home. I listen when I was when I was your age, I had I had two kids at home, and man, that was more than enough. That was more than enough for me. We were we were trying to have a third. And uh, it just never happened. But um, I, I just, I can't even imagine yeah, it's um, a wild what ride. that's like. So. Um, so, so once you started to make money, um, have you stopped making money? Uh, no. You're right. It's like at this yeah. point, <laughs> at this point, you understand profitability, right? I yeah. mean, at this point, there's no way you're not going to make money. Right. Yeah. And it's a lot more, um, it's not that much harder to make money once you figure it out. It's, you know, a few percentage here and there. So it's, there's no reason not to not make money, I guess. Right. So, yeah. And part of the reason, I guess, why you weren't those first couple of years is just because of that rapid growth, you know, growth yep. takes investment um, you said something interesting is like you would buy something and then you'd raise your prices and then you would, you know, something would happen and you'd raise prices again. So you've never really been squeamish about raising prices. I mean, I'm as squeamish as <clears throat> any business owner is, because obviously we want to do, you know, we want to basically do the best work on the tightest schedule at the cheapest price. But um, as far as you just have to you have to price accordingly. Otherwise you're going to go to business. So, right. I wouldn't say I'm super squeamish. But do you want to, but in your marketplace, do you want to be the cheapest? No, absolutely not. Right. Okay. And yeah, most but... of the, most of the, it's kind of funny. Most of the worst customers we've had, there's a, a strong correlation with, we missed something on the job in the beginning and we were the cheapest bid. Yeah. And it's uh, it's just freaky the correlation yeah because usually I, they're the worst customers pays, yeah when someone pays good money they 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 expect that they're getting a good job and i don't know i just yeah we don't want to work for the, we don't want to be the cheapest period right yeah so that's why i wanted to make just make sure that maybe the expectation from others is to be the cheapest but cheapest is not i i think just just from the little bit I know of, of you and your business, I think what you what you mean is you want to be the best value. You don't necessarily want to be the lowest price, but you want to be the best value to your customer, even though that means that you're going to be priced higher. Yeah. In riff, especially in roofing, you can't be the cheapest price. Absolutely not. And be legal. Like, yeah. I mean, if you want to be the cheapest price, you have to cut corners. Yeah. You know, workers comp, something that's going to really not be sustainable. Yeah. Are you using your own crews or using subs to do your install? We're, that's part of our three uniques is uh, no subcontractors. So, yeah. No secrets, no subcontractors, no surprises. Yeah, I like that. I saw that on your ads, which I'm I'm going to be looking at the next week or so, and I'll get you some feedback on. But I really liked that. Say that again. No secrets. Uh, no secrets. No subcontractors. No surprises. And no surprises. And and really isn't well. 
number one and number three is really what homeowners is a big thing yeah. of what homeowners are looking for. Homeowners don't really understand, you know, the subcontractor versus in-house employees until you tell a story. Exactly. And you could tell, and you could tell both stories. You just happen mm -hmm. to choose to tell the employee only story. Yeah. And our market is a little, Washington state has their own workers comp program. So mm -hmm. It's a little more sticky with the subcontractors and stuff. Yeah. Is it ridiculously expensive? Mm, yes and no. If you have a, we have a, like when my rates now are half of what I started because we have a good safety record. So, I mean, one year I paid 200,000 workers comp. Um, oh my God. Now I might pay like 70 or 80,000 for wow. more workers, you know? So yeah, it's a big difference. Big difference. Um, so that was so that takes us to 2008 so things really started to change then in 18 yeah, right we uh we did some big restructuring made some hard decisions in may of 2018 three years into it we were that was two hundred thousand dollars in the hole we were um basically said okay we're growing too fast we're not we didn't know our numbers um so we basically pulled in that year i think we made 140,000 or something. We went from basically in May negative 200,000 to a positive 140,000. Um, and that by, was by what? By getting clear on the numbers? Yes. I mean, we basically put Travis in that. I mean, we're both workhorses, like to work with our hands. We basically tied him down to his office chair and said, you know, make sure we make money no matter what. And uh, so what, what did you did, look you know? at? What did you look at? Because I know this is a, this is going on you know, to people that are listening. So what did you do? Basically, what were you looking at? We looked at everything, um, how we bought materials, how we um, paid guys, how we paid employees. Um, every, I mean, we took the, the profit and loss and just, you know, went through it time and time again. Um, uh, looked at, uh, you know, trends, because we had at this point, now we have three years of trends. We can look at our cost of goods sold. Um, why is this higher? Um, we buy certain things now. We buy in bulk. Um, basically, we st basically streamline processes. Um, and the crazy thing is now, you know, if I flash forward three years, or whatever, um, we basically everyone gets paid more money. Everything goes smoother, um, and everything just lined up. We basically quit talking about selling roofs and trying to grow the company and focused on, you know, making sure we'd all have jobs in a year or two. Cause it was, you know, when it, that, that may, it was, like I said, it was, if someone would have walked in and said, Hey, I'll buy you up for a dollar, taking all your debt and everything. I'd, all you would have heard is my tennis shoes squeaking to the door, you know? <laughs> so, um, but we just changed our whole focus, looked at everything. I mean, the way we buy material, the way everything, yeah, everything was on the table, you know? Because doing this business and not making money sucks. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Especially when everyone wants paid and all that good stuff, you know? Yeah. Now, um, if we kind of let's fast forward to today, th just three years later, yep. um, you have the other company that you bought last year. Um, that yeah, requires two, some of your time. 2000, October of 2019, I bought that company. Okay. So it's been about a year and a half. Yep. Okay. Um, so that business requires some of your time. That's an interesting um, business, but that's not my, the question is kind of how do you spend your time now? So I spend probably 70% of my time on the in the commercial business. Um, uh, that's another thing that really helped the, me buying that um, as a, owner or a, a pusher or whatever you call it. Um, I like to change things and kind of once I, now I spend probably 30% of my time with Ibex, uh, go to my weekly meetings, um, basically help help shore up people where the help is needed, um, R&D, that kind of stuff. Um, so the way I spend my day now, I guess, is every day is obviously different, but certain days I have meetings and I have certain strategic things that I work on. Um, 
in none of the day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, my, I even have someone that checks my IBEX email and because even as an owner, I can't, I can't look at it. Otherwise I'll get sucked into the vortex, you know, if, right. If a customer has a leak, I'm, I'm hard pressed to not drive to their house, you know, so I just can't even look at it. Yeah. But. And that's not easy. With, that's not easy. Right. No. Yeah. It's tough not to, um, yeah, not to want to jump in and react, it, especially when you know how quickly you can solve a problem. Because um, yep. as owners, we're like, we're solution driven. That's what we do. We solve problems. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the toughest things to do as an owner is to let other people take the reins and, and go and do what you hired them for. Yep. And the sad truth is they can usually do it better. You just have to let them. You have to let them. You know? Right. So. And because, and we're going to now go back to EOS, and because you've created a scorecard for the business. And when you create a scorecard, just this is what they tell you in EOS. You're on a deserted island. You get five minutes of a phone or Wi-Fi a week and that to talk to your business. And what do you want to know in that five five minutes to know whether your business is healthy or not? That's your scorecard. And you go through the scorecard as, you know, it, it, let's just say it's sales. Last week, we needed to sell $10,000. We needed to install $10,000. Are we on track or are we off track? And if we're on track, there may not be anything to talk about. But if we're off track, we have to ask a question and say, well, is this something we need to talk about? Is there an issue? And then you solve the issue in that meeting. Um, and so those are the things that you're doing now. So you've got, if you didn't go and buy the other company, um, you'd have a lot of free time on your hands. Yeah. And before that, I was, uh, I mean, honestly, I was really shaking things up too much. Too much. It was, it was going too good and I just couldn't handle it, you know, it was too boring. <laughs> So, so, you know, that's interesting that you say that. That's interesting that you say that because that is something that you will come up against. Um, you know, we talk here a lot about building a business that works without you so that it'll afford you the freedoms that you want. Well, one of the things that happens is all of a sudden now you're freed up and you got to go figure out, well, what am I going to go do? When you have time on your hands, then you can go choose what you want to do. And in Kirk's case, he went and bought another company. Um, how do you kind of see the next um, three years shaken out for your business? Um, the next three years will. So this year for IBEX, we um, last year we did 4.2 million on the residential side. Um, and I think we did 3.6 in 2018. So we haven't had crazy growth the last three years. Um, and we, part of the profitability shift was once we got to that level and focused on profitability, um, we quit trying to grow, grow, grow. Yeah. Um, Cause we had an, we said, okay, we have enough here that we can make something with. So let's make it work before we proceed any further. Um, Very smart. So with that being said, this year is the year that we're, proceeding further i guess and uh this year we're basically on track to about six million on the residential side um and we're actually ahead of that a little bit so maybe even more but six million is kind of our we hired a few more people and um put some stuff in place and six million is kind of our floor where it has to pencil um the next three years i think the three-year goal is like around eight million or so nice um, with a lot of that being uh on the service side repairs cleanings mm -hmm. um, that's one thing that we've done to build our businesses service work is tough to do and tough to make money at but from a, a marketing standpoint it's just right it's, it's brilliant yeah yeah so, yeah it's brilliant um especially with the way you are with your customers and the customer the importance of the customer experience that you've always had and you know such a big chunk of your business comes from um, the relationships that you've built with your customers and the referrals and the word of mouth and all of that. Um, 
yeah, that's awesome. Um, and, and it's interesting too, is once you understand the numbers and once you start to get focused on the numbers, you really start to look at, okay, well, do I really need to grow 40% this year and take on all yep. of the risk and all of the headaches and all of the, the, the money that it's going to take to do that? Am I really going to be in a better place if I'm there than if I'm here or, or if I grow 10% and just focus on yeah. profitability? And I like that that's what you've done is you've intentionally looked at the business and said, well, we don't need to grow that much in order to become more and more profitable. When we've found there's certain in every business and industry is different, but there's certain benchmarks where you can kind of perform at or profit step. If you perform for a while at the top of that profit step and your overhead's kind of maxed out, you can yep. kind of build up a war chest to take that next step. Whereas right. in the beginning, we were just taking every step and you're just taking it right on the nose. Every single time you do it, you never have enough money to keep up. So what's interesting is that, you know, I have clients that have built big, big companies, but how do they do it? Exactly like what you just said. You write out that profitability, you get your cash flow to a point where there's so much of it coming in, you can put away so that you can plan effectively to go to that next level. And I'm I'm glad that you I'm glad that you said that. Well, cool, Kirk. Um, thank you so much for for joining us. I guess I gotta ask you, I mean, what is there anything when you look back, is there anything that you would have done sooner? Uh, knowing what you know today, is there anything you would have implemented sooner um, than you did? Um, probably about everything. I mean, the, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to implement, yeah, everything sooner. But uh, probably the big things was uh, just, I mean, I think the first two years, well, if I, if I had to redo it again, I would do the profit first model when I'm starting out. Um, knowing what I know now. So, okay. and just have better planning and just plan more around profitability than, you know, when you first start, um, you get your logo made and you just want to go out there and get jobs. Right. And that's kind of fun, but it, it'll wear you down, you know, right. I would have focused, I would have done less work in the beginning and, and you know, got my profit right at a million dollars. Yeah. Awesome. So. Awesome. Well, Kirk, thank you. I uh, appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us. Um, again, I'll say to all of you, if you don't have a copy of the Seven Secrets book, go and get a copy at thewealthycontractor.com. And we've got other resources and things there for you as well. So until next time, this is Brian Kaskavalsian with G4 Marketing Group, and this is the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. Let me ask you, did it help you look at your business in a different way? Did it spark an idea or ideas that you hadn't thought of before? Do you have a list of action items that you can take and implement into your business or your life today? I really hope so. If it did, I'd like to ask you a favor. Would you leave a five-star review of the podcast? By doing so, you'll help other contractors find the podcast more easily so that we can help them achieve more success, wealth, and freedom. And before you go, make sure you subscribe to the Wealthy Contractor Podcast so you get access to the latest episodes as soon as they're available. We're always striving to provide you with great content so you don't want to miss what's coming up. In fact, if you haven't already, make sure you go to thewealthycontractor.com and get your free copy of my latest book, the seven secrets to becoming a wealthy contractor. Just pay shipping and handling and I'll take care of the cost of the book. And finally, a big thanks to G4 Marketing for sponsoring the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. For over 12 years now, G4 Marketing has been the secret back office relationship marketing team for hundreds of home improvement and home service businesses just like yours. You get the customer and our proven system turns that customer into five-star reviews and profitable repeat and referral business. If your home improvement or home services company completes at least 10 jobs per month, they have a solution that will work for you. To find out more, sign up for your free, no obligation, 10-minute discovery call at www.g4marketing.com forward slash strategy. 
That's G F O U R marketing.com slash strategy. Set your discovery call up today and they'll help you set your business up for long-term profits and success. So until next time, this is Brian Cascadalsio.